Hello again, and welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We're not doing much fellowshipping during this uh, time of the coronavirus uh, episodes, but we are moving right along in our study of the books of the Apocrypha. Today, we start a, a study of a new book, that's Second Maccabees, this being our first lesson in that book. This book holds canon status in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox Christian communities, but is not so uh, judged by Protestant and Jews. Second Maccabees is not a continuation of the history from First Maccabees. Uh, in fact, it goes on, uh, second, First Maccabees goes on for uh, to include at least two more members of the Hasmonean dynasty. Uh, instead, it's mostly, Second Maccabees is mostly a rehashing of the history uh, that it does cover. I will not follow the chapter by chapter pattern that I, that I traditionally do because so much of this book is stuff that we've already discussed. Instead, I will focus on what scholars have identified as significant new contributions that are found in 2 Maccabees, and, and that's what we will, will concentrate on. I urge you, though, to read all of 2 Maccabees, uh, at least a fast read to it, if nothing else. The author of this book is unknown, uh, as was 1 Maccabees. Uh, the date in which it was written is also unknown, but there might be a little bit of better hints as to when it is, but that's highly debatable. Scholars tend to place this thing anywhere from about 150 BC to as late as 50 AD, so a long period of time. Uh, and if there is an area in where they tend to concentrate some of their arguments in agreement, it's around this 125-124 BC date. And that's primarily based on the letter that we'll talk about today. It may have been written even before 1st Maccabees, strong arguments that it was, even though it occurs as 2nd Maccabees. The original language uh, that it was written, written in was Greek and not Hebrew. Uh, and then it's been translated, of course, into our modern languages. But these translators are very good at figuring out from what language uh, things originated in, uh, even though they're found in other languages. Its authors clearly tell us that, tells the reader, that is, that this is a condensation of a five-volume work by Jason of Kyrene. Uh, however, Jason's work has been lost to history, and so little of it has been quoted uh, elsewhere that they can't really do a decent job of reconstructing it. Second Maccabees' uh, fo focus is on the history from the period of 187 to 161 BC, while First Maccabees went on to 134 BC. It is organized loosely around the threats to Judaism, both the threats uh, that come into the, the religion from influence of Hellenism, as well as physical threats directed towards uh, the temple in Jerusalem by the military of the Seleucids. So, and that military history is very well covered by 1st Maccabees. So I will only touch on those aspects uh, of the military part as they might lean some light in some places, uh, but for the most part we will ignore them in our discussion of 2nd Maccabees, although they are a major part of what's in 2nd Maccabees. This writer gives some details that are not found in 1st Maccabees relative to those, but for the most part they uh, they're just different people's variations on the story. But 2 Maccabees also is considered by scholars to be significantly less accurate factually. Consequently, 
uh, it doesn't hold near the status of first first uh, Maccabees, especially in the military uh, battles and so forth. Instead, much more wordplay is found uh, and meta use of metaphors uh, in in this account. Uh, much is reported in the form of miracles, and is thus much more an emotional uh, piece of writing. And it uh, results in some highly charged uh, emotional aspects at times, as compared with the much drier factual battle by battle approach that was used in First Maccabees. This author clearly is more concerned with the religious uh, aspects of what's going on than the military and historical aspects of what's going on, uh, such as he concentrates early in the book on the holiness of the temple, and it comes up periodically elsewhere. Secondly, uh, mar martyrdom of common Jews uh, is, is, a, is a very common thing. Uh, as contrasted with the concentration in 1st Maccabees was the martyring of a member of the Hasmonean dynasty, for example, one of the, the Maccabee brothers, for example. Uh, and the suffering of the common Jews, especially as they suffered because they were obedient to the ancestral law, uh, that, that form of Judaism, that, these are the things that tend to be concentrated on in 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees opens with two letters addressed to leading priests uh, in the Jewish diaspora in Egypt, Alexandria area of Egypt. Many scholars but not all, suggests that these are not part of the original manuscript of 2 Maccabees, but were in fact added later because of certain relativities and emphasis that they wanted to make. Also, they are in written in Aramaic Hebrew rather than in Greek, or the rest of the book, you recall, is, is in Greek. It is not clear why these letters uh, were placed at the beginning of the book. Uh, but they do call upon the Diaspora Jews to celebrate the festival known to, to us today as Hanukkah, uh, the, the origins of which we covered in detail in the, in the first book of Maccabees. And they touch upon the origin of it in chapter 10 of the second Maccabees, but in a slightly different way. Some scholars argue that the first letter was written to convey this book to the Diaspora Jews and to highlight the keeping of the new Holy Day Festival. Uh, and and it clearly says in the, in the letter that they're writing this in 124 BC. Uh, and so consequently, those people who believe that then really concentrate on that being the date of writing or very close to the day of writing. We need to appreciate that a secondary temple in Judaism had been built different from the one that's in Jerusalem, in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, by the Diaspora Jews. And, and that, that was built according to Josephus in 160 BC. Uh, and it was the direct result of these religious conflicts and civil war that was going on uh, in the Seleucid regimes and in Jerusalem itself. Uh, these Jewish worshipers in Egypt had made considerable change uh, from what was being done in Jerusalem according to Josephus' writings. Uh, and recall that that feast of dedication following the uh, purification ceremony in 164 BC uh, was a very important event and where it had been established as an eternal forever feast uh, was not being done by diaspora Jews and that's part of the effort uh, that's being encouraged by these letters. These people under a separate temporal, temple authority there in Alexandria were beginning to change what, how they were worshiping 
significantly different and much less of the ancestral concept of worship. This letter reminds them that they have a common religion that's based on a covenant established with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with God. They are kinfolks as Jews, that is, of a race of people. And then quoting from the book, May God hear your prayers and be reconciled to you and not forsake you in a time of evil. And we are now praying for, your, for you here, this letter coming from Jerusalem. Josephus writer, uh, writes uh, in his writings, he indicates that the temple in Egypt was built under the direction of a priest who had left. I'm not sure whether it was that he had been a previous high priest or whether he was just in line to possibly come. Anyway, it was, it was as a result of the Civil War. Uh, a major civil war was occurring in Egypt, though, at the time this letter was written, and according to Josephus, and therefore the safety of the Jews that's mentioned in this letter, he says, is in, in part uh, connected with this and shows genuine concern. The second letter has no date, but many scholars suggest that it was written even earlier, about 160 B.C., uh, closer to the time of the, the actual dedication. And it's written uh, to a priest there a different, by a different name uh, at that time. And its emphasis seems to be more associated with trying to get the people, uh, to make the people aware we're going to be celebrating this uh, feast of celebration and you guys should join along. And, and by the way, it'll be uh, in, in perpetuity that this will be done. Uh, so it's urging the celebration of a new holy day is what's there and that new holy day is what we know as Hanukkah eight day celebration but its main body addresses them and, and, is more, and provides us some of the more significant uh, religious, religious insight to this area of holiness of the Jerusalem temple so the focus in the letter is built around that holiness, scholars tell us. Recall from 1 Maccabees that the revolt in Judea was not just a military event, but clearly was rooted in religious differences and conflicts over what version of Judaism would emanate from that temple in Jerusalem. The Hasmoneans who took control militarily and as high priest. Aim was to restore, restore ancestral Judaism, something closer to the, the old Israelite religion versus what was being practiced in their day and time. And to root out any elements of Hellenization that had pre crept into Judaism over the last 400 years or so, 300 to 400 years. There was much debate as to whether or not the second temple was actually still holy after all these events. Uh, second temple was even able that, and therefore wouldn't even be able to practice the ancestral faith because it didn't have the right kind of holy fire. That's kind of what's the center of this argument that's in this letter. And that holy, the issue of holy fire comes up throughout the Old Testament quite often. It's found as issues in the Old Testament. After all, that flame had been destroyed uh, in the first temple when Solomon, I mean, it had, it had been established when Solomon uh, built the temple. And that story is described. So, but the Babylonians then destroyed that fire when they came in and and that had been done, that destruction had occurred over 500, almost 500 years before this letter had been written. Thus the body of the letter is taken up by concentrating on the eternalness of the fire. That's my word. Uh, that's the way I read it anyway. Uh, in that second temple. Bo bottom line is, 
if you don't have an eternal fire, then you it's not holy. It's that kind of a concept. Clearly, the writer is arguing that this fire that's in the second temple is at one with the fire that was in the first temple. And he then proceeds to give a story of a miraculous series of events that occurs that makes it that way. The source of the fire was assumed to be from God by uh, multiple times in the Old Testament. This is the assumption. Uh, the Old Testament stories throughout, for example, they were led from Egypt in the dark by fire provided by God. God's acted in divine as a divine warrior for them at times by pelting the enemy with fire and brimstone or hailstorms and all sorts of things. Uh, Elijah and Moses both received direct communication that it was God speaking by the fact that a fire was there, whether it was a burning bush or something else. And the fire on the first altar was not established by human means, but miraculously through some miracle of God is the way the story is told. And that the whole congregation of Israel at the time supposedly saw that. Yet, it had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Those fires had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And where they were at was unknown. That's kind of the, the story flow or the situation. The Dead Sea Scrolls community in their writings clearly raised the issue that holiness of that eternal fire did not exist. And therefore, they didn't need to worship at the second temple because it wasn't the right place. As did other Jewish and other Jewish groups uh, had somewhat similar arguments according to other sources of scholarship. Consequently, this letter addresses the continuity of that eternal fire from, in, from the first temple to the second temple, which is the, the, the temple that's there. And specifically, they're talking about the fire that's under the altar that burns the sacrifices. Its attempt to convince those questioning through a series of miracle stories is what this letter does as you read through it uh, and to, to the point that the second temple fire is at one from the same source as the first temple. Consequently, this serves as the predicate and uh, need for the purification of the temple and its rededication and so forth and the reason for the season of Hanukkah and and the involvement of fire in that holy day. The story told here is that at the time of the first temple destruction a pious priest hid some of that fire in from the altar in a dry cistern. Fifty years later when the Persians allowed the Israelites to return uh, to Jerusalem they and build a second temple. Nehemiah, the ruler, sent members uh, from the same family of the priests that were involved in hiding it to retrieve the fire. The assumption being that they were guided by God uh, through the generations or that the family had kept it a secret and knew where it was. But they found no flame, only a thick liquid which they took back. Nehemiah ordered that that liquid be sprinkled on the wood and other items that was uh, set up on the, uh, the fire site, the, the sacrificial site. And when the sun finally uh, shone on this place, it burst into flames, just like it had in the first altar appearance. So that's, that's the story. But this author places two more lines in the story. The author adds that the Persian king investigated this weird event and his people discovered that the liquid in the cave was what they called Mappa, which means purification, uh, as he says, not sure where that comes from, 
but is commonly called naphtha. And according to multiple scholars and modern chemists and so forth, they at the time considered that naphtha was capable of drawing fire. We now know what that means. In modern day science, it means it's a highly combustible material. And we know chemically that naphtha will undergo uh, spontaneous combustion if you just break it up and get plenty of oxygen to it and a source of, of heat of some sort. And it doesn't have to be much heat. The sun, bright sunlight is sufficient. Consequently, the fire in the second temple was a key item of debate uh, in, on Jews at the time of Maccabees. And some of my Jewish students over the years had mentioned that this still gets discussed uh, in some of their training as they came along. But this is a story that's used here in this letter to defend that the temple fire is still holy and therefore addressing the need for continuous celebration in the uh, Jewish community throughout the rest of their existence uh, and, and to for what's called Hanukkah and that includes not only the Jews in Jerusalem where the temple was but in the diaspora and by understanding continuing even after the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD uh, by the Romans. I hope you have a good, good Bible study and we'll continue with 2nd Maccabees next week.